people are very optimist. Despite the difficulties, you find people in large debts, you find people unemployed. As long as you are able to offer them a space for living, for their career, for their optimism or for their future, it shouldn't be a problem in terms of communication and, and inter-ethnic harmony. Skopje, a quarter of the two million inhabitants of the Republic of Macedonia, this country in the heart of the Balkans, live in the capital. The Stara Chasia, the bazaar in the old Muslim district, gives a picture of the ethnic diversity. The Orthodox Macedonians represent two-thirds of the population. Then there are Roma, Turks, Vlachs and Serbs. At least a quarter are Albanians. Many languages, religions and groups in one small country. This creates diversity but also tensions. The Turk, Islam Yusufi, grew up in the West Macedonian town of Gostiva. There are three official languages here, Macedonian, Albanian and Turkish. Yusufi went to a Turkish elementary school back in the period of Yugoslavia and at first he spoke only Turkish. Being a minority and being educated in your own language is really a privilege. I mean, you go to a school and you study in your own language. But it was difficult for us to, at that age, to, to communicate with, with others, for example, with the Macedonians and, and Albanians and others. So you are, you are disadvantaged in a sense, in terms of uh, joining the public service, in terms of doing something in the wider public space. My lucky part was that I, I belonged to the family that was active in the society in terms of the business. I mean, going to school, I would go to another shop of my father and help my father in terms of selling his, his cakes and ice cream. And I would learn other languages. The reaction of the customer, if, if he or she chooses to speak in Macedonian, you respond to Macedonian. But you wait until the customer speaks. And accordingly, you react to them. In the city of Ohrid, by the lake of the same name, beats the historic heart of the Macedonian nation. An Orthodox Mass. For these Macedonians, it's more than just a church service. It is a symbol of their unity. In Orthodoxy, the independence of the national church is closely connected with the recognition as a nation. The oldest Orthodox churches of the Slavs are found in Ohrid. It was from here that the Christianization of the Slavs was initiated. The Macedonians are proud of this, but the neighboring Orthodox churches of the Greeks, Bulgarians and Serbs do not recognize the Macedonian church and thereby question the existence of a Macedonian nation. The second biggest town in the country, Tetovo, between Skopje and Ohrid, is overwhelmingly Albanian. For centuries, the ethnic groups in the country coexisted and influenced each other without intermarrying. The Albanians in Macedonia are nearly all Muslims and, as such, heirs of Ottoman culture. Unique religious architecture, like here in the colourful mosque of Tetovo, is evidence of more than five centuries of Islam in Macedonia. The religion of the Albanians was strongly influenced by Islamic mysticism, by Sufism and Dervish orders. Connected to the mosque, a Quran school, traditionally part of the education of Albanian Muslims in Tetovo. Macedonia split from Yugoslavia in 91 peacefully. The ethnic groups remained quiet. The danger came from outside. In Croatia and Bosnia, later in Kosovo, there was war. In neighboring Albania, anarchy. In the north, on the border with Serbia and Kosovo, the UN closed the borders. In the south, Greece imposed a blockade because of the name Macedonia. From the mid-1990s, the economy collapsed. Now tensions emerged between the ethnic groups. These had hardly been noticeable before. I can't recall that there has been any hate speech in, in our classes about other communities. But they, it is very, very customary in, in, the, in the countries where you have the different communities living, you have these critical two words, ours and theirs, you know.
In Gostiva, Islam Yusufi experienced the first bitter conflicts between state institutions and the Albanian minority. Many Turks and Macedonians live here, but Albanians are the priority. They demanded more opportunities and political power, but the state saw the unity of Macedonia under threat and use force. July 97, what happened is that, uh, that municipality hoisted Albania flag and there was a police reaction. The police t took over the, the, the flag and the people came to the streets and they protested about this. And the police reacted harshly and there were deaths and, and injured people. And this overall changed the climate. What happened with the ghost event is that it wasn't just Albanians suffering this, but also Turks suffered this. I know people who were beaten, my very close friends. They were showing the signs on their backs how much they were beaten. So people started thinking, oh, oh there, there is a hidden agenda towards the ethnic communities. This was to happen. They do not like us. We are not welcomed in this country. The violence in Gostiva was a signal for the Albanians in Macedonia in particular. Their frustration was growing. Attitudes were hardening. In the spring of 2001, a man emerged who left his village in the 1980s and spent many years living in exile in Switzerland. Ali Ahmeti became the leader of an Albanian guerrilla. <laughs> This is my country. I have no other country. These here are the fields and pastures I inherited from my grandfather and my great-grandfather. There is no backup country for me. Nobody wants war. In war, there is suffering, there is destruction, but we had exhausted all means of achieving our goals, and there was no other solution other than armed resistance. The Macedonian government presented the rebellion of the Albanians as an aggression from Kosovo. It held the international community partly responsible. It is aggression from Kosovo against Macedonia and it calls into question the entire policy of the international community in recent years. This will give the intervention of NATO in Kosovo another dimension. The population could not imagine civil war. After all, there have been Albanian parties in parliament for a long time. Macedonian nationalists were in power but together with Albanians. In the opposition, there were Macedonian Social Democrats, such as Radmila Šekarenska, 29 years old at the time, one of many young politicians who influenced politics in Macedonia. I was afraid uh, from what was going on around Macedonia and this surge of nationalism and hostilities and, and populism, extremely. We said we are the country of our citizens regardless of their ethnicity. Macedonia was the only country from former Yugoslavia who actually had ensured primary and secondary education in all of the minority languages. Albanian was already also an official language at the local level. And we thought that just by being the first, uh, we will seize all the hostilities and buy more time and solve some of the problems in the future. The Macedonian civil war breaks out in January 2001. In Tanushevsky, a small town in the mountains on the border with Kosovo, the Albanian Liberation Army tries to rebel. Journalists and police still believe it is just a skirmish spilling over from the crisis province Kosovo. Nothing serious, especially as NATO troops are not far away. You would presume that there would be panic, but actually there was not. Because there was this feeling that somehow problems will disappear, and that they will last for a week, and that they're far away. And I have compared this uh, attitude among the majority of Macedonia citizens with the events in, I don't know, Croatia and Bosnia, and I actually saw that this is a typical pattern. People adjust to the conflict, and they think that somehow 
it will not affect their, their daily life. We considered it, oh, this is just the neighborhood of Kosovo and this is why the problems have erupted. The minorities understand much sooner how serious the situation is. Macedonia accepted a lot of refugees from Bosnia and Kosovo in the 1990s. The people know their stories and know what could happen in case of conflict. Ethnic cleansing, expulsion and flight. Should they stay while the conflict escalates? For the I started thinking maybe I should leave. I should go because it's conflict, it's war. You may suffer, your family will suffer. But it was this, what I witnessed with the refugees of Bosnia and Kosovo. It is so much desperate situation of being a refugee. It forced me to, to stay here. Soon there are heavy assaults, including from police troops. Minister happened to be uh, Ljube Boschkovsky, who is now in DIT at the International Criminal, Tri Tri Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And uh, you had that, at that time uh, him establishing a, a unit which was very much causing trouble in the, in the areas where you find the multi-ethnic communities. Purely ethnic Macedonians making trouble. And these people were out of control. a young Albanian woman in Skopje. Ermira Mehmeti was a student at the time. She participated in the investigation of mass murders in Kosovo while translator for NATO. Her reaction is typical of many young people on both sides. I think people were in a way also disappointed, both, both communities, because this was in a way a message that uh, Apparently no one had learned the lesson, no, no one had learned from the experiences of, of our neighbors. People begin to take sides. Others cannot comprehend what is going on. In the summer of 2001, Ali Ahmeti's rebels gain control over many areas where the majority is Albanian. Now they are sitting in Arachinovo, on the outskirts of Skopje. The state deploys helicopters and tanks. If the war reaches the capital, there is the threat of street fighting. Of things spinning out of control, everyone now realizes that the situation is serious. Well, we could actually see it. Uh, the bombing, the shelling of, of the village and the smoke. And we could also hear the fire. If you sit there in the balcony, you could actually see the airplanes flying literally over our heads. At this moment, NATO intervenes. It evacuates the Albanian fighters. The Macedonian population is upset and builds barricades against NATO. The people want to see the rebels punished, but the NATO action succeeds. The bloodshed is stopped. Now the police forces and population rebel against their own government. Police reservists gathered in the center of Skopje, in front of the parliament. They were throwing rocks at the parliament. They were calling for the prime minister to address to them. I guess they were considering this, uh, what happened in Aracinovo, an act of cowardice. Albanians apparently had organized even informal guards in the Albanian neighborhoods uh, just uh, to be prepared in case there is some kind of an attack. That evening was, I think, probably the, the most dangerous evening to spend in Skopje. The bombardment of Aracinovo is a dramatic escalation of the conflict. What the population does not know, the parties have been negotiating with each other for weeks. Everyone wanted to see the hostilities end, but no one was prepared to politically pay the price for this. Politicians could cling 
to the story that we are not negotiating with the insurgents or the terrorists or the fighters. Some people thought that just by sitting down and negotiating among four political parties and the president, we are already committing treason. In the summer, they are negotiating in Ohrid, in a former villa of Tito, a three-week conclave. Government and opposition, Macedonians and Albanians, the EU and NATO maintain contact with Ali Ahmeti's rebels. Since Aracinovo, there has been an official ceasefire, but the attacks continue. Radmila Shekarinska, in the negotiation team at the time, recalls. Just as, you know, the, the discussions started, we had the tragic incident at the road towards Tetovo. Policemen, uh, soldiers were killed in an ambush, practically with a huge bomb. The population was shocked. I think everyone said, OK, we are you know, at war. The negotiations are about to break down. At the last moment, the head of EU foreign policy, Solana, manages to turn the situation around. He puts pressure on the parties. The rapidity, the speed at which the European Union was present immediately after the beginning of the, of the potential conflict uh, was fundamental. And uh, the second thing, we were there with a tremendous tenacity, day and night, talking to everybody hours and hours, and uh, we really prevented uh, the breaking of the negotiations, and we restarted a process that uh, is still alive and, uh, and in good health. We are talking about 2001 and the brink of a catastrophe, and we are talking in 2008 about uh, being a country for the European Union. This is a great success. The Ohrid Agreement is signed in August 2001. It is a milestone. Minorities are now going to be represented proportionally in all institutions. There will be an Albanian university. Albanian language can be used in Parliament. It is a success for international diplomacy. But will the agreement be implemented? At this point in time, Albanian fighters still control entire areas. Ali Ahmeti is a terrorist in the eyes of many Macedonians. Today, he sees the intervention of NATO as the decisive factor. I believe that every delay in intervention would have had serious consequences. But thanks to the reputable efforts and help of NATO in this situation in Macedonia, we managed to prevent a greater conflict between the communities. It takes a year until the last fighters lay down their weapons. In the parliament, power shifts. The Social Democrats win the parliamentary election in 2002, an assignment to bring about peace. But the resistance is huge, including in their own ranks. People said, well, look, all of these things in the Ohrid Agreement are not to be rejected, but did we have to negotiate them under the threat of arms? Maybe we would have reached the same decision even without the casualties. And that's, that's something that is very strong among ethnic Macedonians, that they were pressured into accepting a deal that was not fair. Seven years later, in Parliament, debates now take place also in Albanian. Macedonian nationalists are in the government, but they too have accepted the historic compromise of Ohrid. This agreement was compromised. The other side also was not satisfied. They asked a lot of more to be done. Uh, Macedonian, let's say, side was not fully satisfied. But when you sign, it's signed and you have to implement. And until now, we are implementing this. Ali Ahmeti returns to his home village after 18 years in exile and in the underground. He forms a party which wins the most votes of Albanians and enters the government. He remains controversial. He instigated a war. Without NATO, it could have led to a bloodbath like in Bosnia.
seven years later. Kichevo is a small industrial town in the west, half Albanian, half Macedonian. In Kichevo, we can see the scars of the past, the current reality and the prospects for the future of Macedonia as if under a magnifying glass. Ali Ahmeti went to secondary school here. He does not have pleasant memories. On the one hand, our own families put us under pressure. They insisted that we continued our education. On the other hand, it was impossible for us to perform as expected. We did not understand the subject matter that was taught to us, because we did not understand the terms. So we had great difficulties, and this caused huge dissatisfaction among the pupils. In Kichevo, a lot has changed since then. Today, Albanian pupils go to Albanian classes until graduation. Among this year's school graduates, there are exactly the same number of Macedonians and Albanians. Changes can also be seen in the administration. The school headmaster is Albanian now. In other institutions, especially in the police, there are many new positions filled by Albanians. Inter-ethnic relations in Kichevo have been transformed since the days of Ali Ahmeti's youth. But what are the prospects really like for the new Albanian graduates? The experiences of their parents do not promise an easy future. A few kilometers north of Kichevo lies Zayas, the village of Ali Ahmeti. Zayas is 100% Albanian. Generations of men from Zayas have emigrated to America and Western Europe. Big houses, small palaces testify to the money earned abroad, but many of these houses are empty. There are few men holding the fort in Zayas. They cultivate the land of their fathers. Some old people, small children and the wives of many emigrants are also there. In Zayas, we meet the Osmani family, who live from farming and the money from the diaspora. Family patriarch Ahmed Osmani has been in Germany for a long time. Life was hard back then. There was no work after the Second World War, which I experienced. It was poor. And then there was this way out to Germany. The whole village went to Germany. We were scared, away from home. We could not speak the language. The people pulled at our arms and pointed. That's the shovel. There's the hoe. There's the wheelbarrow. If we had also gone abroad, I think our children would not have come back. We live here from cattle breeding, my father and two of my brothers, Agim and Bekim. That is the family tradition. We have never had anyone who had an education. I only went to secondary school. There are some people who want to work here, but they do not know what they are supposed to do. There is the possibility of working in construction, but only for very few. Most have gone to Germany. For ethnic Macedonians in socialist Yugoslavia, traveling meant something completely different. Holidays. A company-owned hotel and a beach on Lake Ohrid. For workers in socialist companies, this was normality. They did not have to travel, they enjoyed it. Ohrid is still a tourist magnet today. For simple workers, it is hardly affordable, though. He could still afford it a few years ago. Mr. Lazaroski from Kichevo. That's Bobi, the older one. This is us, me and Ruja, my wife. 
This is me again with my wife and Bobby in this photo, also in Ochrid, in the Hotel Silex. And here we are on the beach of Silex. Prefabricated apartment buildings and high-rises. The architecture in the small town of Kichevo today still reflects the socialist dream. So does the city library, which holds 5,000 volumes. Since the breakup of Yugoslavia, no new books have been bought. The local industry is in dire straits. There used to be 6,000 employees, nearly all ethnic Macedonians. Today, factories have largely closed. More than half of the people lost their jobs. The state combine, Tane Chaleski, where Mr. Lazaroski used to be employed, once provided work for 600 people. Then it was privatized. But the breakup of Yugoslavia and the new borders destroyed its old markets. Production collapsed. Now people are trying to make a new start, almost without any capital. 60 employees are standing at Soviet machines from the 1950s. Mr. Lazaroski is also lending a hand. Before the insolvency, I worked as a warehouse manager for finished products. Now I work in production as a classic worker, and it is not difficult. It is not difficult at all. I really like it. I am happy. We are given a regular wage, and we believe in our manager. We will make it again. Thank God it is like this. The wages are paid on time. We earn around 150 euros. That is good for our standard. Actually, it's not good, but it's okay. We will do some other work on the side so that we can manage. It was hard. We were both unemployed, but we had to make it possible for our children to have an education. This is our elder son. He's about to finish his education. This is our younger son at the time of his school leaving examination. Now he's studying at the University of Economics in Skopje, in the third semester. After everything that can be said about his development, he will be fine. He will complete his university studies. It's like that. One will be a lawyer, the other a manager. Sixteen years after independence, Macedonia is still struggling with enormously high unemployment. It's been hard to attract investors to a region associated with instability. But increasingly, there are signs today that a different future is possible. If one follows the picturesque Vardar Valley to the east, one reaches Stip, a garrison and industrial town, and in the old Yugoslavia, a center of the textile industry. There is full employment here today. Wages are low, 150 euros a month, but rising. Shashko Miladinov is one of Shtip's new entrepreneurs. He built up this factory from scratch. The first uh, design is making here by hand, and after that with this digitizer table, we put in the computer, and uh, from the computer, they are going to uh, plotters, to machines for uh, printing. Those systems are about um, 60, 70,000 euros per one system. Factory is, of course, much more expensive, yeah. For total investment, that is more than 5 million euros. At the moment, we have some uh, 12 customers from everywhere, from the Europe and United States. Many more brands because those customers for which uh, we are producing also they have uh, customers, uh, some small orders which are coming from uh, other clients mm -hmm. because we work only with customers which have 100% production per year. Here we have about 10 ladies which every day they are checking new models and making samples, what we say MPM made to measure. Everybody is looking for new workers, but now it's very difficult in this region to find new workers. Some of them I know, yeah. Because it's very important if the people have a problem, that will reflect on our products. 
Around 10 years ago, Shashko Miladinov started with several dozen workers. Now there are 450 people employed here. He himself used to be a manager in a socialist enterprise. In Yugoslavia, that was not allowed to eat uh, private companies. I was working like uh, a commercial director and my salary was about uh, four or five hundred German mark. And I, I was not satisfied with my salary. And then I see ideas that uh, private companies are running and I feel that I can start myself to do something. The textile industry is today the leading industry and the main exporter in Macedonia. It requires little capital and the European market is nearby. It also benefited from Macedonia signing an association agreement with the European Union in 2001. The business always uh, must be flexible, always must be quick. If you have some idea to go to do some business that you need uh, immediately to start and to make communication about that. But we need minimum one week, some, sometimes more, to take visa. Shashko Miladinov, however, knows that joining the EU one day will lead to increased competition. He's already anticipating and preparing for that day. Ourselves, for textile company, will be more difficult because many companies will come to invest in Macedonia. Then it will be a problem for workers. Uh, now, at the moment, we have problem with, with the workers, but after that, it will be much more problem. Then the textile slowly will uh, go down and Macedonia will develop uh, another kind of businesses. For that, uh, we make a building which the height of the building is seven and a half meters. But in future, we can use this building for some other kind of industrial things. Are you rich? Normally, yes. <laughs> for our standard, for Macedonia standard, yes. This is how the future could look in Stipp. Right next door, a German logistics company is organizing the purchasing for customers in Western Europe, from orders to the delivery to shops in Germany. The designs are arriving online. The cutting will be done automatically, as will packaging and shipping. Efficiency is rising fast as Macedonia is integrating into the larger European market. Stipp is also a garrison town. Macedonia is not yet a member of NATO, but the army is involved in peacekeeping in Afghanistan. Soldiers in Stipp are training for the next foreign deployment. Around a third are members of national minorities today. I have been in the army for 12 years. I secured the state boundary and have a great deal of experience. In Afghanistan, for example, we had an assignment to set up a checkpoint and to stop at least five cars and search them. That was the assignment we had to fulfill. The cooperation is excellent. The communication is excellent. We are working hard and preparing ourselves for the next task. Following the Ohrid peace agreement, many Albanians and Turks have become professional soldiers. I'm Corporal Sadov Ali, here in squad leader training. I've been in the army for eight years. I liked uniforms at a very early stage. Then I had the opportunity to join the army, and now I am here. Yes, I hope that my task force will be selected for a mission. I am waiting for this and preparing myself. I am a professional soldier, Fetai Nazim. I joined the army because I have loved the uniform since I was young, and I wanted to serve Macedonia. I'm expecting to be promoted, to advance. The background to Macedonia efforts in international peacekeeping, Macedonians regard joining NATO as a key to ending their isolation in Europe. The NATO accession is uh, very important for, for Macedonia. Like for whole Eastern Europe, first step was first station on the same road was NATO, the second station is EU. And we are explaining that NATO means security, but always security means today and development. 90% of Macedonians are supporting NATO, 95% are supporting EU. We have a full national consensus 
even for the hardest decisions for now in the parliament, uh, for, the, for the new deployments in our missions, uh, we have no vote against. We are very proud of all, all our soldiers because it doesn't matter from which, which ethnic uh, community they are coming, they are just fighting uh, shoulder to shoulder in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are just demonstrating that we can be, uh, make a multi-ethnic uh, army. Back to Kichevo. Here there are few private sector success stories. Like so many others, electrical engineer Mirko Spasanowski also lost his job in the 1990s. His family left its village in the 1950s to go and work in the city. Now the industry is in a sorry state and the villages are also derelict. Mirko is trying to survive somehow. From time to time we still go up there. We have some fruit trees there. We harvest plums and apples. Then the memories come back from our childhood. Also up there is our church and the graveyard where we bury the dead, our fathers and grandfathers. We still go there and light candles and we remember the time we spent with them. But it is hard because now it is all going to slowly die out. Today, Mirko lives from his goats and from the proximity to the state forest which belongs to everyone and no one. Here he gathers wood and feed for the animals as well as fruit and chestnuts. A tiny plot of land belongs to his house. This is how the family survives. Mirko has his own bees. He offers the honey on the market. The only real source of money is the chestnuts from the state forest. He wants to expand this business. The problem is that the state has very few funds, and our town also has no funds. There is nothing to invest. There are nothing but problems everywhere. I am now going to mortgage my house so I can start with this business. My family collects around 500 to 600 kilograms a year, which we then sell. We survive the winter with this money and wait for the spring. Mirko's wife comes from Albania. Right after the borders opened, they found each other. He was her fairy tale prince at the time. My husband and I, we got to know each other in my house, in my town. He came, saw me, fell in love and asked for my hand in marriage. I saw him and I liked him too. I said to myself, a better life, now I have found happiness. Yes, at the time he was employed. He worked at Agrokop, an academic man, an engineer with a good salary, who wouldn't have said yes. It is summer, and in Kichevo, expensive limousines are out on the streets in force. The Albanians who live abroad are back, from America, from Germany, from Switzerland. They're coming to Macedonia to foster family ties and to get married. This gives an enormous boost to the local Albanian economy. Many live the whole year from what they earn in these two summer months. A wedding here still lasts for several days and easily costs 50,000 euros. There seems to be at least one every day. The festas are actually 
Celebrations for us can actually only be imagined with relatives. For me, it is a custom. I go there, I celebrate with the people, and then I go to the next one. We talk about how we live in the other countries, how the situation is, and so on. The bride breaks her ties with her old family. The entry into the new house is elaborately staged. Traditionally, it used to be different than it is now. There were not the restaurants. People got married at home. The celebration was a bit bigger and a bit longer. It was a bit more separated, women from men. That's clear. But nobody forced anybody. In the evening, the modern part of the wedding takes place, in halls built specially for this purpose, for up to 1,000 people. This is a huge business. The fathers demonstrate their prosperity. We used to be very poor, and the Western Europe, where we went to work as guest workers 30, 40 years ago, helped us become a bit better off financially and materially. And it's obvious that we want to show what we have achieved in our lives. When the wedding season is over, the turnover of Albanian business in Kichevo declines drastically. Weddings are no substitute for factories and new companies, but there are few other impulses here at the moment. The Albanians find it easier to feel they are citizens in their own country today, thanks to the Ohrid Agreement. For the inhabitants of Zayas, the situation has become less tense. Yes, before 2001, there were only two Albanian police officers in the police station in the community of Zayas. Now we have a total of 23, 24 police, and 17 of these are Albanian. Today, there is respect between citizens and police. The cooperation is much, much better. And that is the result of the Ohrid Agreement from 2001 and the events of 2001. Since then, the Albanians have been better represented in some authorities. After the Ohrid Agreement, the already existing Albanian university in Tatovo was legalized. With EU money, a second university was created for the future Albanian elite of Macedonia, the Southeast European University. Teaching is done in three languages, Albanian, Macedonian and English. The university has a good reputation. This is why a lot of ethnic Macedonians also study here. The Albanian, Ermira Mehmeti, was one of the first to graduate here four years ago. I was happy to see that uh, males and females saw each other in terms of competition. I think young Albanian men are also becoming part of the global society or relieving themselves of the what we used to call the prejudice which existed in the in the society for so long until probably 2000 2001 one could just count on fingers the number of Albanians that would graduate in Skopje um, if you needed a doctor or a lawyer or an economist who had graduated, who actually had university degree, you would basically know them by, by name.
It is not only among Albanians that roles are changing. In a suburb in Skopje, we meet young Macedonians who attend an Albanian language course. A few years ago, this would have been unimaginable. I live in a mixed neighborhood, Macedonians and Albanians. That is why it is important for me to be able to speak Albanian. Simply so I can understand my neighbors. I'm not Macedonian, I'm a Serb. I work in a hospital. We have a lot of Albanian patients, and it's important for my work there that I can speak Albanian. After the course, the young people relax and enjoy the lively nightlife of Skopje. The Macedonian Maria Kopileva started studying recently at the new Albanian University of Tetovo. I'm studying public administration. It's a new field and that's why it's one of the reasons I decided to go to see you since you have it only there. Well, uh, there were different reactions. Someone said, yes, it's a good opportunity, uh, it's a quality of education you'll find there. And someone asked, why Tetovo? But my parents supported me, actually, especially my father. Yeah, he gave me the biggest support for going there. He, he thinks it's well, the best university here in Macedonia. Maria is turning 20 today. She's celebrating with friends. There are students from all ethnicities. In some lectures we mix when you have English lessons or uh, some other language skills and I'm learning Albanian now and I'm going, need, going to need it if I work here. Macedonian, Albanian and English, yes. In Macedonia, a new generation is emerging which is prepared to bury the hostilities of the past. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about their European neighbours. Greece is blocking Macedonia's NATO entry and is threatening to veto Macedonia's EU membership too. The reason? A dispute about the country's name. Real Macedonians, according to the Greeks, can only be Greek. The Slavic neighbours allegedly stole the name. Greece announced that if Macedonia don't change the name, there will be veto during the NATO summit and Macedonia will not receive invitation. Our citizens are a little bit frustrated because of this blackmail uh, and are not ready to make additional changes. We are ready to discuss, we are ready to, uh, to try to overcome the problem, but completely to change our name and to change our identity, the citizens are, are not ready. A lot of Macedonians no longer want to give up and emigrate. He has returned from the USA, the jazz guitarist Tony Kitanovsky, in order to make music together with Roma and other ethnic groups. The Roma have been playing for centuries at weddings for Macedonians and Albanians. Kitanovsky's understanding of music transcends all boundaries, even the European ones. Balkan music, particularly, I think, had a lot of to do with African music. West African rhythms that traveled North Africa and Middle East and came here. So I think it's pretty similar. And many times I hear people from Palestine or Middle East play something they would take here, you know, as granted, as real Macedonian folk tunes. The Roma play everything, Arabic, Turkish, Macedonian songs, etc. With the Albanians, it is strictly Albanian music. And among the Macedonians, the music we play is a real mix. There are no strict separations, like with the Roma. The Macedonians appreciate the music. They accept it.